welcoming you all to Strategies for Social Studies, challenging your students to visualize reason and think critically about the world. And we're going to be featuring Nice from World tonight. I think you're going to love it. And our I am Melissa Knowles. I'm going to be your host tonight. I'll be managing the chat, so feel free to use the chat. We are a small group, so unmuting uh, is probably going to be just fine when we get to questions. If you have a question, pop it in the chat, and I will present it to Pam when, at an appropriate time. We are recording this webinar, and we also have closed captioning for you if you would like to use that service. But you will be getting a link to the webinar in just a couple days, so feel free to share that with colleagues or anyone you think that can use it, rewatch it, whatever you need, that will be available to you in just a couple days. So I am so excited to introduce our presenter tonight, Ms. Pam Gothart. She is our professional learning coordinator, and she does so much behind the scenes for making sure that there are webinars available that encompass more than just social studies, even professional development, becoming a better teacher, or teaching kids in new environments and worlds. She does so much. Um, with the trainings and map writing. Um, what, what, something that I think is super special about Pam is she not only manages this and is always available whenever we need her, she also has her grands, her flock of chickens, and all of her bunnies. So she's got all this farm and she is just such an awesome person and I cannot wait to learn from her again tonight. So Pam, after that very informal um, introduction. I'm going to turn it over to you tonight. I'm a very informal person, Melissa, so thank you for that. Yes, it's it's funny. We, we often talk about our professional lives, but rarely do we get into those personal aspects, but Melissa is a chicken mom also. So, so let me just say, there's a connection. Uh, but yes, I do have a flock of chickens, and I get beautiful green and blue and brown eggs, and it's just lots of fun. And then I also have a herd of rabbits. Uh, I have five grandbabies, and we just uh, we enjoy getting out there and being with the animals, and uh, it's, it's just a lot of fun. It's relaxing. Tonight, I get to speak to you about uh, some things that are just really near and dear to my heart. I love working with geography and using geography to connect more of those disciplinary lens. It's amazing. Uh, coming from primarily a U.S. His history uh, teacher background, I was always looking for maps, maps and charts and graphs to bring into my history classroom. And unfortunately, I never had uh, this program. It wasn't around at that time. But I think that... Um, you'll find that it's a wonderful tool, not only using with your geography classes, but also any of your history courses. So uh, just out of curiosity, I already know where some of you are from. I appreciate you sharing that in the chat. That was always fun to do. But in terms of Nystrom World, I'd like to know how many of you have a license currently to Nystrom World? Uh, and if you could just yes or no in the chat will be great. And Melissa will let me know what that looks like. I'd just like to know how many of you already have a license versus how many of you might be just kind of in tonight looking around to see what this is all about. And of course, we're going to be talking about spatial and critical thinking as it relates to geography. You know, you guys put in about where you're from. Well, I'm from Alabama. Melissa kind of hinted at that a while ago. And uh, in particular, I'm from the northeast part of the state, a very um, northern portion in Huntsville. Melissa's not very far away from me. She's about 30 to 40 miles uh, down the street, and uh, she lives in Scottsboro, Alabama. I've been working from home for a while. This is what I've been doing for almost eight years now when I wasn't on the road traveling and visiting people like Chardra out in Houston, Texas. I was working here uh, in my home office, and uh, I'm ready to get back on the road and get back out there and see my friends all across the country in person instead of just virtually. So uh, it's good to be with you tonight and uh, good to be able to be sharing with you about the things involved in Nystrom World and how we can employ those um, opportunities with all of our students. We're going to be talking particularly about critical thinking and spatial thinking skills, and we're going to be looking at 
uh, some examples of what they actually look like when they're uh, applied. And then we're going to talk about, well, where do we find these in Nystrom world? And then how do we implement these uh, skills into our classroom? Most of our webinars are designed to run about 30 minutes. So this webinar won't be uh, much different from that. We'll still be in about that uh, time range. The first thing I'll talk about is, is spatial thinking. And spatial thinking really is geography because it is about how those five themes of geography all relate together, whether it's place, location, region, movement, uh, or, or human environmental interaction. It's bringing all of those things together uh, and looking at how they all fit, how they have relationship, and making mental maps for ourselves and those kind of things. Those are all parts of what we think of as spatial thinking. In terms of what we think of as critical thinking, and not that we need a definition for critical thinking, but just to kind of refresh our thoughts of, you know, in, in, in uh, education, we all use a term, and a lot of times those terms mean different things. So I like to kind of clarify what some of those terms mean. So when I'm talking about critical thinking today, I'm talking about things such as, and not all inclusive by any way, by any means, analysis, uh, interpretation, inferences, and uh, problem solving. We're talking about things that have multi-step processes and the ways of critical thinking. I thought I'd start out by just doing something kind of fun first and looking at uh, an activity and determining like what kind of thinking are we doing here? Is it spatial? Is it critical? Is it neither of those? Is it some other type of thinking involved? that the students are using in uh, some of these exercises. So we're just going to play along, and I'll get you guys to play along with me in the chat. So first of all, let's look at the, uh oh, here's the dog. Let's look at this one, and uh, as you can see, we have some content on the left, which is kind of a small amount of content, and then on the right-hand side, we have our questions, which uh, appears to be, first of all, a matching and then a drop-down menu. So I'd like you to just take a second and uh, review this. And then in the chat, do you think it's spatial thinking? Is it critical thinking? Is it neither one of those? Is it low-level thinking? What is this? Give me some idea of what you might think of when you read the question and the information here. So some of you have already, I think, been in the chat and are hitting up Melissa there. Uh, really, this is kind of a low-level thinking because really what we're asking is we're asking a question that the information, the answer, the absolute clear answer is in the text. So we're really talking about kind of those uh, right there questions. We used to call them like a right there so refer to them sometimes as a depth of knowledge one. So we're talking about something that's a really low level type of thinking, but sometimes a great place to get the kids started. Sometimes, and I'm not saying across the board, but some kids do better when they can attack something like this as a first question and feel comfortable about it and feel like, ooh, yeah, like I was able to find that answer. I know that answer. And then move them along. Uh, a little progressively into a more rigorous curriculum. And that can be done in this type of activity where we start them off with something that's kind of uh, a lower level thinking. Now let's take a look at this one. This was a little bit different. Here I have my map, but actually right here I just have a little bit larger version of it. Notice that the continents are not labeled, the countries aren't labeled, but we have a population growth um, uh, legend on the right, and then we have some questions about that population growth. Now, looking at that question, it says using the map, determine which of the statements below are correct. In this situation, you're going to have to use the information that is in the legend, the information that is on the map, and relate that back to those questions. Is that a low-level question? Or is that one a little bit higher than the previous one? What do you think? Higher 
or the same or lower? Higher, same, or lower? What do we think, Melissa? Is it higher, same, or lower? Um, higher is the statements here, but it also, one says, still pretty low, but higher oh. than previous. Oh, that is a great response. Yes, it is higher, but it's still a little bit lower kind of thinking involved here. Good. Wonderful. Now, this is a little bit different, and uh, I wasn't able, able to capture all the drop downs on this one. But again, it's kind of similar to the one we just looked at. There's a population chart. The population is uh, colored various ways on the continent and the different countries, which are not labeled. So again, a little bit higher thinking than our first slide, but still not really like critical thinking yet. Now let's take a look at this one. This one is a little bit different. Let's see what it does. We first of all, instead of having one image to look at, we're looking at two images. So the fact that we're first of all looking at two images, that brings that level of rigor up already because now we're looking at multiple, multiple pieces to answer the questions. And not only that, uh, the graphs here might be a little more challenging. I'm going to pose to you that I think this one falls in the line of critical thinking and see what you guys think. Do you agree? Is it critical thinking? And I want to bring this one up a little bit more so we can see it. Look at this. This is really an interesting uh, chart because you really have to focus in on what's being presented. They're not both being presented, um, in, or at least they're not identical or even shaped the same. So now coming up with our questions of, like for one of the questions it is, in which of these, on which of these continents is there a higher percentage of females above the age of 75? I'll give you a moment. In which of, on which of these continents is there a higher population of female above the age of 75? I'm going to tell you, it actually took me a couple of minutes to sit here. First, I had to figure out what the chart was telling me in both directions. And then I had to really like scrutinize it for a few minutes and analyze it using those critical thinking skills to arrive at what I thought was the correct answer. So this one, we've got multiple steps to it. We're using multiple images. So we're definitely in that range of critical thinking. And what country do you propose has the higher percentage of females over the age of 75? If you said Europe, you would be correct. Now this one, we're really getting into a little bit more. Notice that, again, we're looking at two different images, and both images are representing different bits of information. So in the first one we just did a, a moment ago uh, with the comparison of the populations, at least we were talking about the same thing. Here we're talking about the world population on continents versus the world's population in terms of urban and rural uh, communities. So now we have two very different pieces. We're going to bring that rigor on up a little bit more. But still, I think at this point, we're much in that realm of critical thinking, and we're starting to see those influences of spatial thinking as well, because the students may need to be able to mentally think about where is Asia, where is Africa, and can they make those mental maps of the continents across uh, the globe. So these are just some fun exercises I thought that would kind of get us warmed up and thinking about critical and spatial thinking as we look at how we can deliver that to students. Now this is a completely different tool and a different way of approaching uh, geography. This one is asking us to take a map and do something on it. So not just having the students analyze a map, but now we're going to have the students engage with the map. 
hmm, is that critical thinking? Is it spatial thinking? Or what is it? Now in this one, all they're doing is putting a title on the map. Hmm. But in this one, now we're going to use a pencil and we're going to draw a line around the northern Africa between the brown desert region of the Sahara and the light green grassland at about 15 degrees north. What kind of thinking does that sound like to you at this point? Ah, good. Yes. Go ahead and put those answers into the chat. I love when you guys engage. It's just so much better than watch someone just talk and flip through some slides, right? To engage with what's going on. But yeah, this one's getting into the spatial thinking now. We're thinking about place. We're thinking about region. We're thinking about location. And we might even start thinking about movement and human environmental interactions here. So this is definitely getting into those um, spatial thinking skills. I love this. Here's an opportunity for us to compare and contrast. We've got two different images. One image is a sculptural relief map and the other is a land use map. And we could talk endlessly about how these two support one another and help us to uh, draw information out. So first of all, what kind of land would we most likely need if we're going to grow crops or raise herds? And uh, I don't necessarily mean a herd of rabbits because they're in my cages, but let's talk about a herd of, of cows or a herd of sheep or we're going to have a farm. What kind of land are we going to be looking for in that regard? And we might be able to see some of that over here on our sculptural relief map, get some ideas of where that type of land might lay. And then on our map on the right, we're able to see how the land in those areas are utilized and make some comparisons and draw some inferences from that. So lots of ways for us to bring geography into our classroom in ways that give students opportunities to develop their spatial skills and their critical thinking skills. How many of you could absolutely, if I gave you a pen and paper right now and said, draw a map from your home to your school, how many of you guys could do that? I can. I bet you guys can too. But for students, those skills have to be developed and fostered. And those are some of the things we really want to do through our geography program, Nice Room World. Let's take a look. Last map. This is my favorite map. I have to show it almost every time I'm doing any kind of mapping activity because I love it. I love this map. We always tend to think of Russia and the United States or the former Soviet Union and the United States being a world apart. We're literally on the other side of the globe from one another. Yet, if we look at a map like this that looks down from the North Pole to where the countries really are, you can see that our continents are not that far apart. And during the Cold War, when we were talking about mad, mutually assured destruction, and we were building up our atomic weapons and preparing for war, you can see we really weren't going east or west. We were going north and going over the North Pole to reach one another. And I think that map really helps to bring out, again, about spatial uh, thinking and spatial literacy. Helps us to see how things really do look, either from a 3D to a flattened environment or vice versa. But let's go into live Nystrom World and take a little look around there. I want to just share with you a few of those things that we just looked at in the live environment and talk about how we uh, apply those or give those out and share those with students. So let's just do that. I'm going to switch screens here and go over to our live screen. We'll log in and uh, we're going to just kind of start here for a moment. There are up to four components within Nystrom World. 
and many of you will not have all four. Sometimes school districts buy one or two, sometimes three, but seldom do they actually buy all four because this scholar portion is actually an elementary program, which does go with some of our uh, programs that are here. So some are crossover and then some are secondary and some are more elementary. I'm going to start with our basic one though. This is our atlases and our atlas activities. Now, if you're an elementary teacher, you know what these wonderful atlases look like here. I'm going to start out by using our desk atlas here, which is a high school atlas, uh, particularly for world geography. The point I want to show you here is our interactive activities, and there's a real purpose to this. You also have the Atlas Flipbook, which gives you the Atlas in all of its glory. I mean, it's beautiful, it's engaging, kids like it just because it's engaging, it has a small amount of text, and a lot of visual features to support that. Our interactive activities are what I was just sharing with you at the beginning of the slides today. I'm going to pop over here, let's say, let me just advance through a couple of these. Here's one on world energy resources and materials. I want to bring this one up and let's see how many slides are in this one. This one has eight slides and at the moment I am in teacher view, so you're seeing the answers already. If I'm doing this in the classroom, I'm going, to I'm going to click hide answers so that I can do this uh, with my students and model for them how to use the program at least in the beginning. Just as we saw earlier, the first question that I have here is one of those right there kind of questions. It's a DOK level one. It's kind of our base level of question. There are eight slides though in this particular title. By the time we get to the last of the slides, we're working at a DOK level three. So throughout the slides, the students are going to be moving up in complexity without really realizing that they're moving up in complexity because we're bringing them along in that rigor a little bit slowly. So this is just one of the many ways though that we can offer opportunities for our students to start out at a base level and gradually increase with complexity throughout a particular lesson. And this one, they are reordering the slides. You can move them around. They're manipulated. We see this a lot now with new state testing guidelines where students are often asked to interact with the testing questions. So it's also just a great testing uh, uh, practice opportunity for your students as well. Here we have the two maps. And now that we're in that live version, you can see that we have tools here. The first one is um, that I'll show you is a full screen version. We can make that, that map larger so that we can really investigate it. It's also great for when we're doing this in a whole class uh, demonstration, we can make that, uh, in, that image large so that we can talk about the students with it all at one time. And then we can just uh, execute and get out of that by clicking the mouse on it again. We also have the magnifying tool here, which allows us to, well, when I get a hold of it, it allows us to look again at the map in smaller sectors. So if I want to look at just the point of South Africa there around the Cape of Good Hope, I can do that with my magnifying tool. And then over here, you'll see that our questions, uh, that we have two different types of questions for this one. So our rigor is coming up already. You can see how that rigor is increasing over the course of the slides and it continues to do so until we get to the end of this segment. So this segment again relates back to our atlases and our activities. This is called the researcher. So when you're looking for atlas activities, come here and visit the researcher. Now, the second one I want to share with you, I love this program. It's called Mapping Programs, and we offer three of them, Mapping United States History, Mapping World History, and Mapping Our World. So this time, let's just take a little bit different approach, and let's take a look at how one of the ones related to history looks compared to a geography-based one, okay? So here, we've got the United States history. It's broken down into the 10 eras so that we can jump from one place to the other a little more quickly. Let's see, uh, let's go Great Depression and World War II. 
So here we have uh, our collection for the Great Depression in World War II. Uh, starts out as every unit in this segment does with a close reading activity. The close reading activity here takes about 10 minutes to complete, but it gives the students a little bit of background knowledge going into this particular era. And then we have our New Deal. We have migration. Wow, there was a lot of migration during the Great Depression, right? And so now we can actually look at that. We can talk about, oh, well, let's just open it up for a minute. Sure, let's do that. Let's just take a look at what can be done in the mapping program as we're looking at how it's related to the Great Depression and World War II. Look at our black migration here. That was a phenomenal right at a point at that point. A lot of our black population left the South and was going north looking for those better jobs and more opportunities. And oftentimes down here in Alabama, we say we were just already poor. So when the Great Depression hit, we really didn't know it because we were already so poor. And that really is the truth for, for many, many Alabamians and many of the South um, that were already sharecropping families and, and working the land. Uh, they were feeding themselves. And so when the Great Depression hit, honestly, uh, many of those farmers that were in that situation didn't realize uh, the impact that was having all over the country because for them life was kind of continued as normal, struggling for the meat that goes on the table kind of thing. So we can bring in critical thinking here and we're bringing in those uh, spatial skills. So now we're talking about movement and movement being one of those five themes of geography and how that movement relates to all the other themes of geography and bringing in uh, those higher level questioning techniques and with our directions here on the right-hand side of your screen, students, again, their rigor is going to go up. So it starts, again, kind of at that low base rigor. Add a label. Title your map. Now let's add this. Now let's add that. Then they're having to remember, like, those mental maps of where, where's Alabama? Where, where's Nebraska? Where's this? They're having to use that mental mapping capability. So we're bringing in those spatial skills and those critical thinking skills with this type of program as well. Uh, these are great fun to do with your students and in fun, they are also learning. It's something that's uh, more engaging than some of the other things that we do in the classroom and uh, gives students the opportunity to kind of break out of the traditional and uh, have hands on. So let's go ahead and go back to our home page and I want to show you that third aspect of what we have that's part of our nicer world that again opens up those skills and opportunities for us and that's the geographer. Let me also say this in terms of how things are um, scaffold in Nystrom world. The atlases and the atlas activities tend to, for me at least, I think of these as being like our base level, the most basic parts of geography that we all do, escalating to the mapping program, getting a little more sophisticated, a little more rigorous in what we're doing as a student, then to the geographer, which is kind of at that top level of what we can now ask students to do with the maps, where they can create their own presentations and give it back to us. They can add, um, they can add video to their map. They can add songs to their map. They can add primary sources to their map. And they can submit this back to you as a project. They could even present it to the class as well. There's a lot of components involved in this particular piece. I just would go through these uh, with a little bit of definition to share with you what we do have available. Here where you see the folded map, that is where you're going to find just a variety of maps from which the students can mark and engage. We have elementary, middle school, and high school level maps, and we have just a variety of thematic maps here. Let's see, here's just a variety. Here's one with a uh, participata uh, precipitation table. We can see the areas that get more rain than others. And we can also look here at the I. That I is our country information. I'm going to turn that on for you. Let's see what that looks like. See all the white lines now? And I can highlight a country. So let's say I want to highlight this. What country is this? Well, this is Chad. Here's a little bit of information about it with the flag. But if I click on that more information, now I'm going to get 
information about Chad, its geography, its people and society, government, economics, and communications. And all of this is available for every country around the globe. So now we're offering the students even more opportunity to hone in on the different countries, build that mental map, and build more of those spatial thinking skills as we not only build not just the physical evidence of where a country is, but their political boundaries and how they interact with other countries and the movement between countries. Let's go here. This one I shared with you uh, in our slides. We have a split screen where I can now take this map and change it to any other map that I want to move it to. Let's see, let's put one here and let it populate and I can compare it now to any other map. The map uh, choices for this side are here in the middle. This one will impact only the map on the left and now we can draw comparisons between any of these maps with our students and then of course we can go back to a full screen by clicking that. So there's a lot of things that we can do here. We can also go down here and find our toolbox and this is where kids can build their own presentations to share with us. So whether it's about movement or if it's about, uh, maybe it's about how we first started exploration around the world, whether it was Magellan or Columbus, we can plot that on the map now and the kids can actually build that for us and they can share what they've learned, they can create anything they want to create on here. I know this is an oversimplified version of what this really is, but if you think about the map as being like your PowerPoint slide and you're going to put information on that slide. That's one way to look at this. It's a very simplistic way, but I'm a pretty practical person, so I like to do things in a simple manner. We can title our map. We can add, uh, uh, we can add place markers to our map. There's a lot of different things that we can do here to help the students build those spatial skills and to create presentations that they can share with their, uh, with their classmates and with you as a teacher and that you can even grade and um, work from as well as that way. It's a full um, uh, research project. Okay, and the way that we get to share so much of this with our students in Nicer World, I'll start with the researcher. Pam? I, yes. <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt. I was trying to catch you while you were still in there. We did have one question. Um, okay. Do you have a variety of proje projections for the maps, or are they all Mercator or Robinson? Do we have the same projection? Like, is it all Robinson projection or whatever in terms of that? Like, yeah, yes, other varieties of projections. That is a great question. Um, I would say in the atlases, you're going to find a variety of projections. And in fact, in some of the atlases, they do that up front and they show you how the different projections work. But in terms of like the mapping programs themselves, I think we use one projection throughout. Um, but I do think that we do offer those other projections and teaching about those other projections in the desk atlas and in the world atlas. So. Um, let's just open the World Atlas here for a minute. This is a middle school version atlas for, for a world geography or, or world regions course. And in it, let's say if we open our flip book, that was a great question. Let's just take a little brief tour here at the beginning. Uh, okay, this one did not have it. It must be in one of the other atlases. It shows the various projections. But if I decide that this is the atlas that I want to use with my students, and I'm not in a teacher account. Oh my gosh, so sorry about that. There's a little um, icon to the to the right which allows you to share that atlas with your students, and that's how you would then be able to provide that out to them. I um, 
And then in terms of our other products, you're able to assign these out. You can either click on the individual ones. Uh, let's try world history for a moment. You can click on the, the silhouette and assign that out to any of your classes. Uh, and it's because, let's say, I'm in a, um, I'm not in a teacher mode, so it's not letting me share all those. But I can share that by clicking on the silhouette. So applying these to your classroom has never been easier. You can incorporate it into your history courses. If you're talking about Mesopotamia, why not let, bring in a map about Mesopotamia and make that even more interesting and more concrete for your students because that helps us to have a firmer foundation of where things are and what things look like when we bring those maps and charts and graphs into uh, the classroom. So let me do stop here and take questions. What questions do you guys have about how we can apply these activities from Nystrom World uh, into our classrooms and how that allows our students to have more opportunity for critical and spatial thinking. Questions, comments, what would you guys like to know more about this evening? And Melissa, I'm going to open the chat so that you don't have to uh, read the questions to me or anything. And uh, we'll see what we've got here. Okay, anyone have a question? Michelle has a good comment that geography is definitely underappreciated. Good, good, good. Melissa, from our beginning, about how many uh, or what percentage of our participants have their own license of Nystrom World already? So all those except we have one that has the Nystrom atlases that they use. Oh, okay. Pieces, and that's Julia. So fantastic. Yes. Good, good, good. Wonderful. I don't know if you realize, just speaking globally, we do have somebody here from Poland, Warsaw, Poland tonight, which is awesome. I'm sorry, Melissa, I, I didn't quite get all of that from you. I'm, I'm having a little difficulty keying you tonight. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm, I've, I'm allergic to something that is blooming. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry. We no have, problem. We have a participant tonight from Warsaw, Poland. Oh, wonderful. Yay. So glad to have you with us. Thank you for joining. That's yeah, pretty that is cool. awesome. Fantastic. And Jill says she has a set of the U.S. history atlases. Mm -hmm. um, she does want to know what the benefit would be to adding the Nystrom World program mm -hmm. in using her U.S. history atlases. Well, first of all, I love your atlas. And I think if I were if I were to buy one thing to start with, it would be the atlas. So I think you're on the right track. The thing about being able to uh, come into Nystrom World with it is that now in Nystrom World, instead of having just the um, activities that come with your atlas, you have these interactive activities where the students are going through the slides, getting the information, answering the questions, and the questions escalate from DOK1 to DOK3. In your atlas and the activities that come with your atlas, they're all DOK level one, so it's not bad. It's just a lower level. Uh, a starting point. So for me, being able to use the interactive pieces would be really nice. I also uh, really like the mapping activities where the students can actually create uh, things on the map and share that back. I think it's just, you know, um, I've been out of the classroom for a while and we used to use the colored pencils and we would co my kids loved coloring a map. I mean, they absolutely loved it. I taught high school and they thought it was like the greatest thing ever. But uh, this is such a much higher rigor of what we used to do with those pencil and paper maps because now it's just so much more engagement, um, so much more opportunity for them to really interact with the map and, and, and move things and put things in the map where it belongs and tell a story uh, with primary sources and videos and, and songs to, um, to share with others. Okay, uh, let's see what else we have here in the chat. 
Oh, that is an excellent question. Thank you. Great question. And the answer to that is yes. So let's see. In this particular program, because the students are putting icons and things on the map, it does not grade it for you. However, it does in the grading program, and let me see, let me switch over to a teacher account real quick, and I can at least demonstrate a, a small portion of that. For the parts that are not graded for you, such as the maps themselves, the map, the, um, Oh, darn, I'm in a trial version. Well, I'm not winning on this one, Melissa, goodness. Uh, it shows you the map that the student should do next to the map that they did do so that you can do a compare and, and grade however you see fit. However, if it is multiple choice or true false questions, yes, Nystrom World does grade it for you. And um, it grades it in such a way that if, if one slide has seven questions, it grades all seven of them individually. It doesn't grade like a page at a time. So it's a great way um, to be able to give your students something that's really meaningful, that really supports what's in their standards in their state, and you don't have to sit there and grade all the paper. So it's a great program. I love it. Okay, let's see what else we have over here in the chat. Oh, for blank maps. Okay, great idea. So let me go over here. Let me open this um, map, the geographer, up for you for a moment. And Melissa, I think I'm in the right place. You might need to hit me up in the chat if I need to go elsewhere. But I'm going to come here for the moment. I'm going to go up here to where our maps are. Now, not only did we have like all those different types of elementary, middle school, and secondary maps, you've also got these um, history maps. There are 32. U.S. history maps and 32 world history maps and I believe we have about 16 Texas maps for those of you that are um, in the Texas area. But I should also have blank maps and um, let me see. Melissa, I think I'm in the wrong place. Do you know where I should be to find our blank maps? Where? Uh, blank maps. I know we have them by state. We have like regional and statewide ones. I was adjusting your count so that you could hopefully. Um, there it is. We will respond to you after the session tonight because I honestly cannot think at the moment. Uh, where the blank maps are located. And, and I know we have blank maps because we do use those um, in a variety of lessons. So I will have to look that up for you and get back to you. If you are already a Nitrogen World user, you may know this uh, yourself, but in case you don't, the question mark right here at the top right of the page provides for you an opportunity to contact us with your questions or concerns for help. Here is your teacher user guide and also the student guide. And in the student license, they also have a guide that tells them about all the features and how to use all the different things in here. For one thing, uh, the toolbox has a lot of options. And I think that's important for the students to know how to utilize right off the bat because they're going to be using that in the mapping programs. So let's see, let's go in here and open our flip book and you can see all the different ways that we can use it, including, which uh, if you haven't tried it yet, students can highlight in the context of the text. They can highlight main ideas, supporting evidence that is customized based on what you want them to read and highlight. It annotates in the margins. And here is our uh, reading tools, our text-to-speech tools, where it will read to them uh, passages that are in the map and coming very soon, not there yet. We do translate the uh, text pieces, but coming very soon, the entire map will be able to be translated into more than 30 different languages. So that's an exciting piece that's coming your way. Oh, there's the one I wanted to show you too. So here's our toolbox, 
and it tells you all the different uh, icons in the toolbox and how to use each one. So that's a great place uh, for your students to get the information they need, and it starts right here on the page prior to page 11. Okay, let's, uh, any questions or comments? If you haven't used your teacher's guide yet, take a look at it, it has a great resource, it tells you how to do everything in Nystrom World. Okay, did we have any more questions that I need to answer, Melissa? A lot of information, yes. Um, okay. Not yet. Thank you all so much for letting me share a little bit of Nystrom World with you this afternoon and talk with you about critical and spatial thinking and those skills that are involved. And hopefully you will add more and more of our mapping programs and atlas programs to your uh, regular classroom teaching and give those students that opportunity for speaking and to add even more support for your critical thinking as well. Uh, thanks for being with us this afternoon, and I look forward to seeing you in another uh, webinar. Come back and visit with us. All right, so I'm going to put an evaluation in the chat since that will um, conclude our, our webinar for tonight. Let me paste that in there. So I'm including the evaluation. If you'll just let us know how we're doing, how we can improve, and bring to you what you need and want to become better in your classroom. Also, we have, if you need a professional development certificate, please email help at socialstudies.com and we'll be happy to get that to you so you can get credit for the time here tonight. And those, that information is all in the chat for you. Thank you again, as Pian said, excellent job. These are great resources. There's really, when I, when I think of these and how I use them in my classroom, there's no, the world is just open to what you can do with this. And it's so important for students to know where things are happening, even as a librarian. We are always talking, yeah. something, always happening somewhere. So, great way to bring in those, uh, great way to bring in those uh, news articles and all, Melissa. Thank you. So thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Help at socialstudies.com is correct, yes. Help at socialstudies.com if you need a professional development certificate. Thank you, everyone, today. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, Melissa. You're a fabulous host. I appreciate you so much. Oh, that was fun. Sorry. <laughs> Bless you. I know. The allergies are terrible. I'm so sorry. Yes. Thank you, Julia. After you click that eval link, it'll open to a new window. Feel free to close your Zoom screen at that point if you would like to. Yes. I think my son has asked a few times to come see your buddies. <laughs> he loves your buddies. <laughs> I keep saying buddies, but I'm saying buddies. <laughs> okay, Elaine, I'm going to add that again for you. Sometimes it gets lost in the, ch in the chat. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I did that to a direct. I hate when it switches. When somebody sends you a direct, it switches it in Zoom. And I didn't notice it when I sent the. Oh, oh. <laughs> there, everyone's waiting for those. Oh, no. <laughs> It's all right. We all make mistakes. Yeah. Got to check that I'm, who I'm sending it to. That's funny, Melissa. Thank you, Julia. Thank it you happens. For <laughs> addressing that and letting me know. I appreciate it. <laughs> it sounds worse than it is, but I don't know I what it's blooming. I hear you. Yeah. But everyone have a great night. Change of weather. There. Yes. And that little cold snap. Thank you, Elaine. Yes, yes. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, everybody. We're so glad you guys came on for a while this, this afternoon. Yes. Great. Great time in sharing this resource with a lot of new people, which is awesome.